Well, good afternoon, stone-faced Michael. Now, you accuse me in your comment section today of being low and mean. And I suppose there is, in a way, I can be very low and mean, especially in comment sections. Especially when I hear people like yourself spouting the rubbish that you were spouting in that video. Okay, against Bible truth. I don't care whether it's called Calvinism or whatever. It's just that I call myself a Calvinist because that's what the theology is called. Okay, that's why I call myself a Calvinist. It is Bible truth, it is scriptural truth, and I'm going to share some of that truth with you now. And um, with the hope that um, I will knock some sense into that head of yours. Now, if I was as low and as mean as you made me out to be, and then you blocked me like the coward that you are um, from your channel, um, I would not be bothering to make this video, trust me. Because I was actually having a very, very nice and very lazy day. I did not want to get up and do a video. So if you want to call me low and mean for trying to share scripture truth with you, then by all means go ahead and call me low and mean. I've been called far worse names by better people than you uh, in my time since I've been on YouTube. In fact, in all the time since I have been on a Christian, 24 years, almost 24 years that I've been a Christian, people have called me far worse names than low and mean. So, um, if you want to think that we Calvinists are low and mean, you better believe it, my friend, because we are entrusted with the faith once for all delivered to the saints. We fight for it, and we fight for it like tigers. Because it is God's word, it has been entrusted to us, and we are exhorted, mandated, to study, to show ourselves approved. And then we are exhorted to defend that faith with every means possible to us. Now, I'm going to read out of the nearly inspired version of the Bible. Okay, so if you don't like that, you might as well turn off this this video right now but I'm using this particular version for this particular passage because I like the way it says it okay if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 from verse uh, 10 it was the prayer that David prayed after he had uh, raised all the funds to build the temple and of course, we know that David was not allowed to build the temple because he had blood on his hands. So his son Solomon was going to build the temple. But David was the fundraiser and he raised the money to build the temple. And when all the money was in the coffers, this is the prayer that David prayed to the Lord God, the Alpha and the Omega. I want you to listen very carefully to this prayer, please. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Now, this is the God of the Bible. God of the Bible is the one who effected our salvation from beginning to end, all of it. I, I can't emphasize this enough. Now you're saying that my videos you will not post because they are evil. I defy you to pick those videos apart and tell me what scriptures are out of context in those videos. But you will not post them. You see, this is what I get with you people. You, def you deny scripture. You deny vast swathes of scripture. 
I mean, you sit there with your little stone face and you pick us to pieces. You pick the Calvinists to pieces. I want to tell you something. We do not have stone faces, looks on our faces, the Calvinists. You see, within Calvinism, there is a saying that erudition is the Calvinist condition, which means we are educated. We have educated ourselves. We have taken the time to study, to show ourselves approved. We are not dummies. We do not have that look on our face. Our eyes are alight. They have the light of God coming out of them. Whether it be flashing from our eyes, whether it be friendly, a soft look, or whatever way it is, but it is not an ignorant look that we have on our faces. So I always smile, smile greatly when I see people like yourself calling yourselves the usernames that you do. Stone Face Michael. There are others. Wells Without Water. There's a user with that name. Whitewashed sepulchres. Whitewashed tombs. Clouds Without Rain. Why do you call yourselves these names? I don't understand that. I, I don't understand that. So if you want to make yourselves out to be stupid, by all means, go ahead. Because it seems to me that anybody outside of Calvinism is not erudite. Okay, and then I get told by people that I make them look stupid or feel stupid. Here's my retort. My retort is go and learn something. And then maybe you won't feel so stupid. Okay, now I want to read another scripture to you. And eventually I'm going to end up this, um, this uh, video. With, and I'm going to read through Romans 8. But I'd like to speak to you about what power the Word of God has. I think it's Psalm 138 verse 2, uh, which says that uh, God magnifies His Word above His very name. He magnifies that Word above His very name. Now, I'm going to read to you from Isaiah 55, starting at verse um, 6. And this is what the Lord God has to say to us who are called by His name. Now, if you are called by His name, truly called by His name, I pray that He will open your eyes and illumine you to what I'm going to read to you now. Because He says, and this is actually Jesus speaking, believe it or not. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, uh, your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now I want you to listen to this analogy, how the Lord God uses an analogy that we are familiar with to explain to us how his word works. Because in verse 10 it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, we had a beautiful white Christmas here. I saw that snow just fell out, still lying on the ground outside. For as the rain and the snow came down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. I think the King James Version says it shall not return to me void. Okay, so this is the word of God and how it works. We are to go and proclaim it. We are to preach it, especially the gospel. We can only declare the gospel. We can't endure it. We can't redo the gospel. Okay, so now there were a couple of things that you kind of picked us Calvinists out for uh, in your video. You, you kind of said that uh, we make God out to be some kind of a monster. Uh, the God is not the God of the Bible. 
But I'd like to share some scriptures with you and see see what you would like to do with these scriptures. Okay? Let's try Isaiah 45 verse 7. Let's hear what you have to say about this one. This is the King James. The Lord God says, I form the light and create darkness. This is the God of light. Okay, he created darkness. It gets worse. I make peace and create evil. This is the King James Version that's saying this. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, there are scriptures in the Bible that tell us how wicked we are, how evil we are. Okay, and I'm going to read three of them to you. They're, they're kind of my favorite verses to use because they're very, very descriptive. And um, the first one is Ecclesiastes, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 3, which I used in my last video, by the way. And it says this, This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Now I take it you are a son of man, son of men. Um, and madness, madness is in their heart while they live. And after that they go to the dead. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We, you know, the Bible says that when we plead our case with God, we cannot even plead our case with God with integrity. We can't do it. We can't do it. We can go before the Lord, go before the throne, but we're always in our little black hearts lying. We even try and lie to the Lord God. Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only, only, only evil, continually, continually. Now, we're going to get, I'm going to start going, getting onto the gospel here. I'm going to read Romans verse 8 to you. And I'm going to try and exegete Romans verse 8 or the little parts that I'd like to, to, to share with you. But I, I want to warn you first of something. And the warning goes like this. It comes from Isaiah 5.20. And uh, the Lord God says this. Yeah, you can't twist the scripture. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now you and many other people on YouTube have called Calvinism satanic. I can't warn you enough about your words. You are calling the Lord God a demon. He has preserved his word for us. Okay? You're calling him, you're basically, that's what you're doing. You, I defy you to found, find anything anywhere in what I have said today on any of my videos that I have misquoted scripture or quoted it out of context. You, you find that, then you make a video against me, telling me and the rest of the world why you think I'm such an errant little Calvinist. We'll see what happens about that. Okay? Now I'm going to go to Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to read to you Romans chapter 8. But hold on a second, there's just one more little scripture that I'd like to read to you. Just to tell you quickly, um, you know, how useless we are how helpless actually would be a better word we are okay because people say well Calvinists make God out to be a monster now I did not unfortunately print out the King James version it just says it so beautifully but I'm going to read you this version it says it the same way it's Proverbs 21 verse 1 it says this 
The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he, God, turns it wherever he will. Mm, my word. Doesn't that give us a bit of a shock? Our hearts are in the hands of the Lord like water, and God turns our hearts whichever way he will. What are you going to do with that scripture? All right, let's go to Romans 8 quickly. And let's see if I can preach the gospel to you out of Romans verse 8. Because there is such a thing as law and such a thing as gospel. You need to be able to distinguish between the two. Otherwise, you're never going to understand the doctrine of justification by faith alone. It seems to me that every time I teach on a doctrine on YouTube, a spate of videos comes out against it. Like just recently, I was teaching on the sovereignty of God, and there's a spate of videos coming out against the sovereignty of God by the most unlikely people. Now, I'm teaching on justification by faith alone, and these videos being made against this doctrine. This is the doctrine around which the entire Protestant Reformation hinged, was the just doctrine of justification by faith alone. All right. Let's start with Romans 8 verse 1. For those who are in Christ, okay, those who have been chosen, elected, before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. He, God, chose us, the elect, in Christ before the foundation of the world. What are you going to do with that scripture? Are you going to ignore it? Okay, let's go through Romans 8 quickly and just shock your little brain to life quickly here. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. No condemnation ever again. You're uh, not an eternal security person. You believe that the Lord God is not able or capable of um, keeping his people. You're, you're guilty of blasphemy against the Lord God. You're making him out to be a liar and the truth is not in you, Michael. Okay. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What, do you get set free and then get put into bondage again? Because that's what you're teaching. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. Okay. God did it. Take note, God is the one. He has done it. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For, the, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. See, they can't be talking about non uh, uh, Christians here because Christians are not subject to death, not spiritual death anyway. If you're going to say that, you're going to contradict verse 1 here. Okay? So we're, they're talking about the reprobate, the unsaved, the lost. Um, is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law. You see, we don't submit to God's law, we submit to the gospel. We believe the gospel. We who are in Christ, we believe it. Um, indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you know that there is a verse, I think it's in Jeremiah, which says that um, the wicked can do nothing to please God. Even their plowing, even their, uh, their um, attempts to uh, support their families, it's sin and wickedness in the eyes of God because they have not put him first. Okay? 
You, however, this is verse 9, are not in the flesh, talking to us now, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, he's asking you a question, you see. Are you sure? Do you know that the spirit of God dwells in you? How do you know that? How do you know that? Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, the, uh, but if by the Spirit put to death the, uh, the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. A lot of people use that, the, those words there to say that we can fall back into what? To fall back into a lost state? It doesn't say that. It says fear. Christians can fear too. But the Bible says the mind that he stayed on God, he will keep in perfect peace. But of course, we, we can't do that. And then it goes on to say, But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself, listen to this very carefully, okay? The Spirit within you, the Holy Spirit within you, who came along and quickened you to life so that you were able to believe that gospel. He's, this is what the Bible is. Okay, I'm sorry about that, but my computer, my laptop was unplugged and it bombed on me, so I lost my train of thought there for a while. So I'm going to pick up in Romans 8 starting at verse 16 and I think I was reading speaking to you about the Holy Spirit the one that dwells in us that is our earnest our uh, deposit that seals us in Christ okay he is the one that comes to us and it says here the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God the Holy Spirit tells us that you don't have that witness. Do do do. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now you see there's a mixture of law and gospel there. It's going to take me far too long to pick that out for you, but there's law and gospel. There are things we can do and things we find impossible to do. You need to grab hold of the promises of God in the Bible. That's what you need to do. The promises of God. Not what he tells you to do, but what he says you can do through him or in him. Those are the promises of God. Anything that God does for us. Okay. Okay, where am I? Verse 18. Now we're going to get to the happy stuff here. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So we are the ones to whom God's glory is going to be revealed. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. This is a present continuous thing. This is saying that those who were chosen by the Father in Christ, way back before the foundation of the world, they are in a period of time being revealed. They are being manifest. That's what it says here, verse 19. For the creation means everything. Waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation, now the year we're going to come to the second law of thermodynamics, the little entropy. I'll show you a couple of things about the Bible, my friend. For the creation was subject to futility, 
not willingly, but because of him, God, who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to what? To decay. Entropy. Everything decays in a given order. See? And obtains the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And of course, that little uh, scripture there puts an end to this nonsensical uh, old earth creationism. creationism. The Bible does not teach that. It does not teach that in Genesis and it certainly doesn't teach it here. Okay. Verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. That's the future thing. That's what the resurrection was about. If there was no resurrection, we would have no hope. We would be serving a dead saviour. And actually, the Bible says that if Christ did not rise from the dead, we of all people are to be most pitied. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You see, it's God, 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 God doing it all for us. You see, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. See, God, 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 the Spirit, 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 Spirit. See, they're doing it all. God's doing it all. Praying for us. Jesus prayed for us in John 17. And then it goes on to say, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. God's Spirit. Okay, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to what? The will of God. Not according to our will. We're not free. We don't have free will. Where do you read that in the Bible? You show me one verse that teaches free will in the Bible. We have not free will. It says here, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Remember Proverbs 21.1? The heart of the kings is in the hand of God like water, and he turns our hearts. Okay, and we know that those who love God, uh, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, I've got to just explain this again. For new, for no, does not mean that God looked down the ethereal corridors of time, took a look around and saw, oh, these are the ones that are going to believe on me. Mm, I think I'll choose them. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No, no, that's not what that word means at all. It means that God knew them before the foundation of the world. It means he chose them without merit. He also predestined, so those whom he foreknew, God foreknew them, okay? Not because of anything we've done. Remember the gospel says no works, no works, no works, no works. So if we are the ones who believe, why would God choose us? You know, that makes it our works, okay? You need to understand that. To be conformed to the image of his son, in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. He, 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 God, 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 God. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now I want to show you a dictionary. I think you should get this, okay? This is the American Dictionary of the English Language. But look at the date. It's the Noah Webster 1828 version. 
I would seriously recommend. If you want to learn English properly, get that dictionary. Seriously, you'll learn. You'll, you'll read it. It's a good dictionary. It gives you the proper definition of words. Okay, where was I? Okay, so, so God did all the calling. He foreknew them. He predestined them um, to be conformed into the image of his son. Uh, that they might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he predestined, he called. And he justified. And he glorified. I don't know what part of that scripture you don't understand. That make us low and mean. You know, we are taking the scriptures out of context. Okay, let's see. Verse... My eyes are going potty on me. Um, <laughs> I think that says verse 31. Okay, what then shall we say to these things? Listen to this. If God is for us, who can be against us? He, God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, how will he not also uh, with him graciously give us all things? God. God does it all. He gives us all things. Everything. Um, and then it goes on to say here, yeah, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? And that's what you've done, sir. It's your stone face. You sat there and you have judged the Calvinist. You have called them in their theology satanic, satanist. You and your little pal, Jackie Snacky, 77. Okay? You don't know what you're doing. Okay. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Christ Jesus. Um, more than that, who was raised and who today is at the right hand of God. There's the gospel for you. Christ died, was buried, was raised. You need to believe that. You have to believe that. You have to believe it. Okay? I don't know how you're going to believe it if you don't have the spirit of the living God living within you. If he's not in you, you're never going to believe this gospel. Never. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Okay, listen to this, you little scripture-twisting demon who says that God is not capable of keeping his saints. Listen up right here, sir. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution? Persecution, like people like you, who call us Satanists, okay? Or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Careful what you say with that mouth of yours, Mr. Stoneface Michael. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through, through, through him, God, who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, or things that uh, to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you going to separate yourself from the Lord God with your little sin? Seriously, stone face Michael. Seriously. Your God is very small indeed very very small because it says here anything else in all creation that includes yourself 
so there we have it now I'm going to end this video now because personally I think I've given you enough time and you can call me as many mean and horrible names as you like I don't particularly care it's my job to tell you the truth okay and I'm sorry that I had to do it in this manner and with this attitude and with this look on my face and with the fire flashing out of my eyes but I don't care I really don't care you want to sit there with your little stone face and with your nice little voice and your kind little ways sit and call us Satanists you don't even know what we teach you have no clue not a clue you take any of these scriptures that I've quoted you today and you make nonsense of them I tell you what I won't be the only Calvinist, Calvinist to come after you I tell you what I'm not even the worst one I might just have the biggest mountain that's all so Michael, stone face Michael, you're welcome to keep your stone face. Not me, my friend. Not me. I'm an erudite Calvinist. I've educated myself. I am an educated South African woman. You can do that what you please. Okay, so I certainly hope that you will have learned something through this video. It's not my intention to be nasty. I, mean, I don't like being nasty to people. Okay, but sometimes it just helps to put things across in a very, very, very strong way. Actually, I really hope the video, this video, will uh, help you to learn something. My love to you in Christ.